everybody. So I think I'm the last thing standing between you guys and alcohol, so I, I, won't, run, I won't run too long. OK, how about that? So what should we talk about tonight? Well, first, let me, know, let me let, uh, inform you of where I've been. I started in Barbados, and then I went to Scotland, then I went to London, then I went to Tokyo, then I went to Vietnam, then I went to Seoul, then I went to San Francisco, and I just came in yesterday from San Francisco here to Boston. So I'm a little tired, a little worn down. I've been on the road for about a month. My dog I have not seen for a month. So when I come home, he's going to bite me and pretend I don't exist. All right. So what should we talk about today? Let's talk about collective delusions, programmable societies, and where this insanity is all going. How about that? All right. Yeah, you know you're on the right track when you get to talk about collective delusions, right? So what is a collective delusion? Does anybody know? Sure. That guy's a physicist. A collective delusion is a government, a religion, for example. Collective delusion can be money. It's something that we just as a society agree to accept. For example, why should we vote on a particular day? Why should we have a holiday on a particular day? Why should we have a particular leader? Why does somebody have power? Why do you work for money? Because you believe the money you're getting is going to be worth something. And worth something means you can get products and services for it. So you assume there's a market there, right? Markets, corporations, governments, religions, all these things are just things we invent. And there's social consensus around them. And we do this because it allows us to coordinate at scales that are unimaginable. Because the reality is you really can't get it beyond a few hundred people in your personal social network. So you need some sort of external artifact to trust people you've never met and to work with people you've never met. So the first great challenge in the story of cryptocurrency was to achieve enough of a network effect for Bitcoin to have a collective delusion around it. See, when Bitcoin first came out, there was nobody. It was like one guy. His name was Marty Melny. He was the only consistent person. Came up with that little Bitcoin logo you guys love. And occasionally, Hal Finney was doing stuff every now and then. But the reality is there was just nobody. And it was worth nothing. You couldn't get anyone to accept Bitcoin for anything. Couldn't even buy a damn pizza with it until a little bit later. Took some time. Then suddenly turn the page on to 2013. What happened? Well, it got valuable. That collective delusion got so strong that Bitcoin achieved a network effect of a billion dollars of market cap. There was trading going on every day. People got serious about this and they said, this Bitcoin thing, it's here to stay. So much so that many people, myself included, were willing to quit their jobs, quit their lifestyle, and just go all in into this insanity and actually say, hey, let's do something interesting. But here's the problem what a collective delusion sets. You have different faiths form. You have different ways of going about things. You have this idea of use and utility. People say, ah, oh, well, the money is programmable. But then why is the scripting language so terrible? Why can't I do anything interesting? Why is this just a push transaction where the sender pays? No, 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 it's got to be better. It has to be more interesting. So the first generation was all about delusion. The second generation of cryptocurrencies was all about programmability, it was all about this grand exploration of many different ideas, many different business logics, many different domains. Maybe some of you care about killing ICANN and creating your own domain registrar. And maybe some of you are very passionate about property registration. Maybe you're a refugee and you had your land stolen from you. You say, there should be a ledger that people can't manipulate. OK. Maybe some of you care about identity and reputation. You say, maybe eBay shouldn't own my reseller rating. Maybe we shouldn't have a credit score anymore. Maybe we should have something more fair. There's everybody's personal problem. And they said, I want to solve that problem. And if that meant I have to go get my own network effect, I have to build my own blockchain, write my own tech, figure out all this crypto, that wouldn't get anywhere, would it? So what made the web great? You didn't have to build your own web browser. You didn't have to build your own huge software stack every time you wanted to write a web application. No, you just wrote it in JavaScript. So when a programming language met the web browser, that's where we got the Gmails and the Facebooks and all these magical things we now take for granted that multi-billion dollar companies have been built on. So the second generation of cryptocurrencies was all about how do we bring programmability to these ledgers? What the hell does that even mean? Who runs the computations? What does the language need to look like? 
what is efficient, for lack of a better term? How much should I pay for that? Who should pay? There's a lot of open questions there, right? Just like the delusion question. Like, what is good money? We're still having that argument. And that's the great thing about these debates, first generation, second generation, is that they never actually close. They just introduce the question such that you get enough people involved that they realize they need to do more. And now we're in 2018. Markets are huge. They're collapsing right now, but they go up, they go down. If you're a veteran in the space, you have seen that. I watched it go from a dollar to thirty dollars, down to four, four dollars up to two hundred fifty-six, two hundred fifty-six down to eighty, eighty to twelve hundred, twelve hundred to two fifty, two fifty to twenty thousand. It goes up, it goes down. Okay, who cares? What's here to stay is there are millions of people all around the world. There's great researchers all around the world doing interesting things. So. Those interesting things are converging to a new generation. What's this all about? It's saying we like our delusions, they're great, and we love that we've democratized the ability to have a delusion instead of giving it to the pope or to the king or to the government. And we like this programmability concept, that's great, but we'd like it to work at scale for millions of people, billions of people, whatever the hell that means. That's still not clear to me. We'd also like it to work with all these other delusions, all these other systems. Guess what? There's well over a thousand cryptocurrencies and there are legacy systems. You think we're going to throw away $10 trillion of software and value that these legacy systems have built? No. We have to talk to them. We have to use them, right? But what does that actually mean? What do we mean when we say interoperability? I mean, we can move tokens between them, move information between them handle compliance, attach attribution and metadata? It's a big question. And is it resolved? Oh, no. Are there people who tell you it's resolved? Of course. And the token sale starts next week. <laughs> and then finally, we have the biggest question, which is how do you pay for stuff and who's in charge? This is the ultimate question and the one that you get to once you get far enough down the funnel. Because the reality is there's this thing called the golden rule. Anybody know the golden rule? He who has the gold makes the rules. It's universally true. Whoever's paying for something is the person in control, some way or another. And you can federate that. You can have donation telethons all day long. You can do all kinds of things to try to create some theater. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be a small group of people, usually are bankrolling something. Like, could you imagine the F-Sharp Foundation saying, you know, we don't like Microsoft anymore. We're just going to go and do our own thing. You know, maybe we're going to go support Oracle and have some fun there, compile F-Sharp to run on the JVM. Probably not going to happen anytime soon. F-Sharp's a language Microsoft created. But it's a not-for-profit, right? Yeah, but Microsoft funds 100% of them. So that's one thing. It's the golden rule, so who pays? And the other thing is, how do we decide? So for example, we have these cryptocurrencies that are supposedly decentralized. And you saw some great research just before about, hey, there's some attacks on Ethereum. We should fix that, right? Well, who decides that? The EIP, right? Ethereum improvement proposal. But yes, who adopts that? Well, the developers. But who elected them? Well, well they kind of are leftovers. But anybody can be a developer, except for the people who can't. Right. And that's the problem, is that there's actually not a clear way of governing these systems. So here's what we do in practice. We always do this, cult of personality. So, if we can't decide, we pick somebody to decide for us. And that person will have the courage to move forward. And if the co social contract works in such a way that if they screw up, we get to demonize them. And if they succeed, we get to lionize them. That's usually how humans operate in one way or another. Now we can federate it, we put the force of God behind them, we can do all kinds of things. We're very good at that. And we've been good at that for thousands of years. But cryptocurrencies are now grading up against a very old human problem of decisions, of who gets to decide, where do we go. So this is the third generation in a nutshell. Now we think this technology is worthwhile to expose to billions, not just some nerdy people who have the luxury of money. And if we're going to do that and actually going to use it for things that are going to have meaningful impact on our lives, our property, our identity, our money, then we have to answer some basic questions about what's the social contract, who controls that, how do we sustain it, how do we upgrade it, how do we maintain it, and so forth. So that's the goal of my company. That's what we think about all day long at IOHK. I started IOHK two and a half years ago, 
And I had enough money and time to basically just do whatever the hell I wanted to do. So I said, I'm going to start a research company and a science company and an engineering company. And what we're going to do is embed ourselves in the university. So we have a lab at Tokyo Tech and a lab at University of Edinburgh and a lab at University of Athens. And we write all these papers. And they're very annoying papers because they're just littered in math. They're fun to read. Sometimes they get into peer review. Sometimes they don't. We complain about how evil those committee members are or how biased they are because our papers are always awesome, according to me. And uh, the magic of that is that it's given us an insight into a different way of looking at cryptocurrencies. So we're building our own third generation cryptocurrencies called Cardano. And so we just started from the very beginning. What is a ledger? Does anybody know? What is a blockchain? What is it? It's just an append-only linked list. But what about those Hashgraph guys? Isn't that a DAG or IOTA? Is that a DAG? Is that a blockchain too? Well, well, what's the security model? So we created something. It's called GKL15. Good paper. There's some competitors, but basically says this is a ledger and gives you a security property to it. And then what is consensus in the cryptocurrency space? You hear proof of work versus proof of stake versus proof of this, right? So we did some research on that matter, try to unify things as much as we could. But what we discovered in this process is that there are a lot of different ways you can do things, and really it comes down to some assumptions. And that's the problem that every single person in the third generation blockchain space is running into, whether you're Ethereum seeking scale or your EOS promising scale with your $1.5 billion John Oliver criticized war chest, or your IOTA with this tangled mess, or whatever you are, everybody faces that, what are the assumptions? And it comes back down to who should be in charge, and why should they be in charge, and what should we pay these people? How much should we pay these people? Is it okay to pay people a billion dollars a year to run Bitcoin? Is it okay to pay them $10 billion? Who gets to decide that, right? And so that's what we're trying to figure out in our project. And it's a fun, fun process. But to get to a solution, I think the way to go about it is a bit different than the way the space is going about it. See, the great sin we're committing is the belief in the leader. And the reality is the best thing that's ever happened to us in the cryptocurrency space was the fact that Satoshi left. If you think about it, you have this guy who, if he just stuck around long enough, probably could have become crazy rich, made himself public, and you know, rode off into the sunset, got a Nobel Prize in something. It would have been a very famous guy. But he left because it was required for Bitcoin to actually achieve its goal, which is it needed to not have a leader. It needed to not have a face. And unfortunately, all the third generation protocols, mine included, have a face. It's either Charles or Vitalik or Dan. It's the guys at IOTA. You can always find a face, a corporation, an entity, and so forth. So I think if we're actually going to solve these problems and answer these questions, what we need to do is we need to start focusing on the process, not the people. We need to start focusing on have to agree on how do we actually go about answering. Who should we ask? Where should we go? We have the peer review process. I love that process. It's great. It's a lot of fun. I get to go to Israel next month. I like Israel for EuroCrypt. And before that, I was at crypto. And crypto is great. You always go to Santa Barbara. You drink the same wine, hear Diffie tell you the same story. Actually, I wear boots too, so we compare them. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but the magic of that is you get criticized by all kinds of people, and they're smarter than you. Silvio McCauley is a hell of a lot smarter than me, I'll tell you that. And I get to have a lovely debate with him every time we have it. And at the end of the day, the community gets into the same mode of thought, and they start writing papers. And you start seeing competition. For example, when we published Ouroboros, now there's been over 50 citations for it. There's a sharding protocol built on top of it called OmniLedger. We had nothing to do with that. Some guys just decided to do it. And we may agree with them. We may disagree with them. There's certainly a plenty of opinions about our work, some positive, some negative. But the point is, everybody's now thinking about a common problem. And that doesn't have a face. That's the important part. It has a process to achieve excellence. It has a process to achieve an end. But no face. No one's in charge of it. And whether I die or go away, I know that the research is going to continue. So that's one part of it. The other part is we have to solve the funding problem. And the good news is that's actually a simpler problem than you'd think, because the reality is we've already got the delusion of that we can print our own money figured out. The reality is a cryptocurrency is a central bank. It just prints money. It says, you want some Bitcoin? Here's some Bitcoin. Here's your monetary policy. Set it, forget about it. So Bitcoin gives it all to the miners. But do you have to do that? No. 
You can take some of it and put it into a little bank account, a decentralized bank account. You create a balloting process, kind of like the NSF or something like that, and decide who gets to vote and who gets to spend from that treasury. And guess what? It's been done. Dash did it. And others are doing it. And we're doing it. But the long and short is that means that you no longer have to go to a central entity to ask for money. So what does the golden rule mean then? You're representing the interests of the people who get the vote. And if that's a big group of people, that's a very diverse group of interest, right? So that's another problem, a common problem, that we have to solve, in my view, in a space, is finding better ways of funding the development of cryptocurrencies. And in my view, if we have the ability to print money out of thin air and people are actually willing to accept it for products and services and their own currencies, why the hell don't we just do that and create a treasury? Ah, but then your cryptographers will come in and go, oh, but Charles, e-voting is very complicated. And Appel will come out of Princeton and he'll say, oh, you can't even do it. He'll just yell at me and throw something, right? Uh, and then the game theory people come and say, what about rational ignorance, Charles? Isn't that a big problem? I say, oh, yeah, it is. Does anybody here know what rational ignorance is? Show of hands. All right, we got a few people. The long and short is the value of knowing something is less than the cost of learning it. So, for example, you think about health care. It's really complicated. My family's been in it for 60 years. Grandfather's a doctor, dad's a doctor, brother's a doctor. They invested a lot of time into thinking about health care. I have not. And if somebody asks me a Medicare question, I'll say, I don't know. It's the truth of the matter. I've never really informed myself too well of the intricacies of the system. I could if I wanted to. And I saw how hard my brother studied and my dad studied and all the books they read. And you know, at the end of the day, if I spent that much time on it, you know what my vote would count? Exactly the same as yours. So does that mean I got rewarded for that investment? No, I did not. So is it rational for me to put that much effort and time and money into learning these types of things, just so I can be a good citizen. No. You know, there's a lot of great people like Robin Hanson and others who think very carefully about these things, and the reality of the matter is if you construct systems with perverse incentives or the incentives are misaligned with what you want to achieve, the output is always the same. You don't get the system you want. And you can yell at people, you can put them in prison, you can call them bad citizens, but at the end of the day, it's your fault as the designer of the system. So that's the other thing, is if you're going to build a voting system, decide where should blockchain go? Where should my new cryptocurrency go? I'm a third generation cryptocurrency guy. And we're going to vote our way out of it. We're going to vote for forks. Well, that's great. What is the incentive for the person voting? How much do you pay them? What do you pay them? Who pays them? Right? Ah. So that's a hard problem. It's something we think a lot about, and there's a lot of ways to go about it. You know, you can even think about filtering. So there's like the liquid feedback or the representative democracy model, where you say, I'm going to give my vote to Bob, because I like Bob, and Bob will be paid. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. America has representative democracy. Do you feel represented by your representatives? Do we like our president? Some people do. Maybe he'll make us great. I don't know. Maybe not. But that's the point. So this is the issue. So what I love about the blockchain space in closing is that it forces us as everyday people to actually think about these problems. The reality is before blockchain stuff came around, before Bitcoin came around, 99.9999% of the people of the world would not be involved in making decisions about printing money. That's a central banker's job and not many people get to sit in that chair. And before blockchain came around, the vast majority of people were not involved in voting in terms of building voting systems, deploying voting systems, deciding who gets to vote, what incentives are there to vote. Now you can, all of you can. And the same for property, the same for identity. We now, seven billion people in the world, have equal access to the ability to rebuild society. And what that necessarily means is chaos. Lots and lots of chaos. But chaos is good. You know, there's one of my favorite pictures is read at the funeral of an English monarch who happened to be related to most of Europe's royalty. And this was right at the turn of the 19th to 20th century. And so almost every king in Europe showed up for his funeral. And guess what? Just 10 years later, almost all of them were deposed because of World War I. You go from an old social order where kings rule and everybody knows each other, and just in a flash, the whole world changes. And that's where we're at. We have this technology. It's yours. It's not mine. 
And everybody is free to use it any way they want, however they want. There will be scams. There's going to be craziness. There's ICO mania, $4.5 billion, and everybody's printing money out of thin air. We got Bitcoin Cash. We got Bitcoin Gold, Bitcoin Unlimited, Bitcoin Private, Bitcoin God. And there'll be Bitcoin Chair after, before it's all said and done. That's fine. But at the same time, there are people trying to solve real problems. And they will solve them some way or another. And they don't have to ask for permission. So as we move into the third generation, uh, we've passed the collective delusion. We've passed the business logic phase. And now we're asking, how do we actually do things at a scale of billions? Uh, these are some of the things I, I think about, the peer review, the figuring out how we reach consensus. And we certainly have our bag of tools. And I could be totally wrong. And that's why I come to great places like MIT to be told that I'm totally wrong. So I'd love to have your questions. Thank you. I think my mic went dead, so I'll try this one. Is that better? OK, yes, sir. Hello? OK. Hi, what's your name? Hi, I'm Carl. Where are you from? I'm from Maryland, but I live in Cambridge. Do you like long walks on the beach? <laughs> Maryland has great beaches. And I heard say. that, right? You just get stabbed after eight. What's your question? <laughs> I, I'm still here, so. <laughs> so you don't walk on the beach. OK. Uh, we have a boardwalk. So as you were talking about um, kind of governance, how to organize cryptocurrency, and this idea of chaos, I was thinking about how the monies we have today, like from governments, is organized around culture and, say, constitutions and founding documents. And as we have all these new technologies coming out, there's different cultures for each coin, so to speak. And I'm wondering how much do you think culture, you know, in terms of leadership, but also like the people involved will determine the outcome and the use of these currencies versus just um, technology or infinite forks or infinite potential? Right, it's a great question. And I think culture is tremendously important there's actually even books written about it, like The Social Life of Money. And if you read The Ascent of Money from Niles Ferguson, it's certainly something he mentions. And he's got a new book called The Square and the Tower, which is all about that. So highly recommended. Good book. Thanks. But uh, no, culture plays a huge role. And so there's the, the first the question of, will these things maintain cliques or will they merge? And when they merge, are they you know, cooperative merges or destructive merges? So if you have like one system that collides with another, you know, do they absorb into each other and, and they become harmonious or, you know, does it actually hurt the community? That's a good question. And then how big can they get before they get unstable and collapse? So if you look at a chimpanzee troop, for example, can't really get more than a few hundred members before they split, right? But the reason why humans can coordinate is we have these ideas of social fictions and by adopting them, we can coordinate at gargantuan scales. So is it more important that we create one ubiquitous vision and culture or is it okay for us to live in a variety of opinions? So imagine, if you will, you have this idea of a universal wallet. Okay. And everything that can be tokenized is tokenized. What would you put in your wallet? Well, if I just had one, I guess I'd put everything in it. Yeah, but what is everything? Oh, so, for example, everything? let's say you put some USD in there. What else would you put in it? But, um, Ada. Obviously. Oh, yeah. Well, Ada's great. I love that girl. <laughs> what else would you put in it? Um, my car. Your car. You tokenize your car and you put your car in there. Maybe your house. And maybe you put some stocks. Maybe you put your airline miles. Okay? All right. Now, what if you have that and all the payment systems are now programmable and you've got a market maker that lives in between? So when you're at Starbucks, guess what you can do? You can pay your barista in airline miles. The Starbucks employee gets paid in dollars because the market maker deals with that. Now, if we live in this kind of a world, does it really matter if one standard is the master of everything? Or what matters more are all of these connection points toll-free and decentralized and low cost, and there's no entity that can control them? You see, if I can do this, then it doesn't matter where I live. 
My value can be stored in any profile I want. Never before in human history have we had the ability to do that. But this is also tremendously depowering to the regime. You know, China, for example, they have this idea of a My Citizen score, and they're starting to push it out. And they're starting to say things like, if your score gets too low, maybe you can't fly on a plane. Or maybe you can't ride on a train. And maybe your taxes get higher. Or maybe you lose your job. Or maybe we revoke your passport. And if the PPOC issues a cryptocurrency, maybe you can't use your money anymore. See? So this matters a lot. Thank you. So Thank it's you. like the web, where a lot of different things can work together. But you can see why interoperability is so important. Because what if your steel token or your stock token and your airline's mile token can't talk to each other? Can we ever put them in a single wallet? No. Exactly. Right. Never commit the sins of Microsoft. <laughs> Anybody ever use ActiveX? You. I'm sorry, you. Amy. Um, Charles, you're, you're talking a lot about um, leaderless blockchains and self-standing systems. Um, and I know a lot of that comes down to a, a treasury system. Right now there's other projects that are working on um, building these DAOs and treasury systems. How is what IOHK uh, is doing is, is going to be different from, say, what Dash is doing and um, what uh, Decred is doing and other projects, especially in terms of the voting, which as I understand it is the most uh, challenging part of creating a treasury system, right? Right. So the thing that we're doing differently, frankly speaking, is that we're connecting our work to actual prior academic results. Uh, this was not done by PIVX or Dash or Zencash or anybody else who's in that space. Uh, so we did a literature review and we said, well, what's a reasonable voting system? Liquid feedback kind of looks like that. And so we did what all academics do. We wrote a paper. It's out of Lancaster University and we have a guy named Bin Cheng. And we also did a nice whiteboard video kind of explaining how the system worked. But it's a, it's a liquid feedback style mechanism. I don't think we've seen that quite yet. Now one thing we haven't solved and we're still thinking about is what are the incentives to vote? So there are the mechanics, and you can have many different mechanics. You have many different voting systems. You can either vote for Hillary or Trump, or what if we had a linear preference ordering, like Condorcet or Borda? Then in that case, you don't vote for Hillary or Trump. You say, what is my first preference? Uh, Bernie Sanders, okay. What is my second preference? Uh, maybe Mitt Romney, okay. And you can just create your list, and then maybe other people create their list, and there's a way of counting that to actually decide who's the winner for that system. So your voting mechanism yourself has a huge impact on the outcome of the elections. Whether you end up having small, you know, uh, fra fractured parties or dominant parties. Also, thresholds matter. You know, do you need high participation, high threshold, low participation, low threshold? And that's probably connected to the value of systems. So for us, what we decided to do is say, well, the people who should be voting uh, let's delegate to them, and let's delegate to them on a case-by-case -case basis. So not a representative, but more of a liquid feedback style system, and now we've gotten to the point where we're starting to think about incentives. Now in terms of the actual tech under the hood, we have all the buzzwords you come to expect, like additive homomorphic encryption and these types of things, and that's just great. Read our paper and it'll be fun. It's a nice word salad that only a cryptographer could love. I don't. I'm not a cryptographer. Uh, but we don't have a, a full solution yet, and we won't have a full solution until the end of the year. And if then, of course, it'll be the best solution, because it's our solution. Um, but as for the rest of the guys, I admire their courage, and I admire the empirical data they're providing. For example, when we entered this space, we looked at Dash, and we wrote about a 70-page paper. And we looked at everything from the mechanics of the system to participation in the system. And what we found in the Dash paper, which is available on our website, iohk.io slash research, is that we found that very few people were actually voting. So it was more of a whale-led system, and very few people were receiving ballots. So submitting ballots and actually getting their ballots approved. And those people had a transitive associations with the core developers. Now, is that okay? Depends on the way you look at it. When you're small, and only a small group of people are qualified to do things, in your opinion, it's reasonable to assume that only a small group of people would be paid. So the question is, the trend over time, is it getting more open and more open? And we didn't discover that in our analysis. So that's one problem we see in that system, and hopefully it's resolvable. Now, there are many ways to think about it. The other thing is, do you want to have voting based on stake? This is actually one of the biggest misnomers in proof of stake. You don't have to elect people. 
based on how much stake they have in the system. You can come up with other metrics. You could come up with some abstract notion of good citizen, whatever the hell that means. And then say, if you have enough good citizen points in the system, you have more voting power than people who have less good citizen points, completely divorced from the amount of stake a person has in the system. And you can use that for electing people for proof of stake as much as electing people for serving in a committee to decide who gets funded, right? Do you have voting on chain or off? So that's another good question. So right now we've actually developed systems for both. Um, probably the best idea for treasury is to do it as a side chain. And what you do is you just peg it and you say, all right, send money to this address and it goes off chain. And then you have an independent system that's easier to upgrade and change. Uh, but you can do it on chain as well. Uh, you're still, because our system uses some heavyweight crypto, uh, it still requires a lot of m meta stuff to run, like MPC and so forth. Yes, sir. Good question, by the way. Yeah, uh, I guess you. on that side. Thank you. Um, so a lot of the value that I've, I've seen as an observer of this industry has been kind of connected to fiat money and actually the value of real hard currencies that governments support. Right. Um, if you if you decouple that, then you end up with kind of funny money. And, and you know, I've never seen a chart of Bitcoin just saying, oh, this is a, the amount of Bitcoin not converted to dollars, right? So what recommendations would you have for people developing technology that promise, this kind of distribution, whatever, but to, to, to think differently about converting to fiat and perhaps developing systems that are totally decoupled from fiat but are, right. are self-sustaining. You, have you found strategies that work? Have you right. found like cooperativism or, or such things? It, it's a really interesting question. So isn't it funny if you're in Europe, let's say you're in Germany, there's nobody in Munich who says, boy, I just got 500 euros. Man, I can't wait to go to the cash exchange to go to dollars so I can go buy a sandwich. Right, because they have a functioning economy. In a functioning economy, you use the local currency to buy products and services, and you don't think about Forex too much. You fuel Forex. That's the difference. Um, so there have been a lot of ideas, like Venn and other things, which are a bit centralized. And there's been a bunch of proposals throughout the years about you know, how can we create a value-stable currency that's based on something and tradable. And there's barter economy ideas and so forth. Uh, and the answer is we don't really know. So there's an emerging field of cryptocurrency research called the stablecoin research. And so you have things like MakerDAO and Clearmatics. We tried with BitShares with the BitUSD idea. But generally it comes down to if you want to do it without being backed by something like the dollar or the euro as an IOU, then you use market forces where one party agrees to take risk and they get all the upside, but they also get the downside and there's kind of a volatility window you're protected with and then the other party gets stability and there's some sort of premium that they pay for that. So we did experiment with that, that CFD notion with BitShares and it didn't work out so well. It doesn't mean it can't work, it just means it gives you some dampening. And then the question is how much dampening is required? And that's referential to the country the person lives in and the market the person lives in. Uh, for example, if you're in Venezuela and I come to you and say you have a 12% annual inflation rate, you'd be like, wow, that is good money. But if you're in America, you'd say, no, nah, that's terrible money, right? Because we have a more stable economy. And that's the problem with uh, these things is that, you know, they're contextual to the domain that they're deployed into. Um, now, for our part, it is an area of interest because we work in Africa. For example, I'm going to Ethiopia in May and uh, we're setting up offices and other things and there is just no way we can have credit without a stable currency. So I can't with a straight face say I'm going to solve the microcredit problem and the uh, remittance problem but not have an asset that's stable. There's just no way to lend it, right? So we need to solve that. And if we can't solve that, then what we need to do is figure out the interoperability problem such that banks can tokenize fiat in a more safe, fungible way and then allow those assets to be traded on open networks where they're not subject to things like civil asset forfeiture or capital controls and so forth. And they're ubiquitously honored. It's an interesting question. It's an area of research we're going to get involved in, but we haven't quite started it yet. And when we do, we'll certainly bring in some good people and it'll be a lot of fun. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Charles. Good to first, see you. Where first, are you from? I'm from here at MIT, actually. You're an so, MIT student. I am indeed, sir. All right. <laughs> Woo! MIT. Yay. Uh, What's so, your major? So I study physics and computer science. Specifically, uh, I work with photonics and artificial intelligence. So who's your favorite professor in, in, uh, in computer so science? fair. Come on, uh, it's Eric Domain. We all know. So my PI, so I work between Max Tegmark and Martin Soljakic. Okay. And I've really thought both of them have been great leaders in the field of both AI and photonics and AI and deep learning and stuff. 
So I have a plug for them. My question is twofold, if I may. So coming from the research and academic domain, research takes time and peer review is fairly kind of a slow process. Right? When you put a paper out, people sometimes find errors in proofs or errors right. in algorithms years later, simply because it's been out, a lot of people have seen it. Right. So my question is twofold. So first is, what is the time frame that you pitch your projects and pitch to your investors that you think that the d research and development that you work on will become reputable? Because obviously, being the company, you guys will spend a lot of resources, but versus the entire academic community as a whole, you can't beat out a thousand cryptocurrencies. Now, when hackers. you say reputable, what is your standard for repudiation? A difference of opinion or an actual flaw in the paper? Uh, flaw, specifically okay. flaw. So the first question is, what's the time frame that you pitch and you believe? And second is, how do you plan to kind of confront and try to better resolve the issues about slowness? Slowness? Well, I guess it depends on the, first, the answer to the first question, but broadly speaking on the second. So slowness in terms of peer review. Okay. Precisely. Yeah. Okay. So the good news is computer science is a hell of a lot faster than other fields. <laughs> that is certainly true. Yeah. We have conferences here apparently. You know, I was a mathematician, so we didn't have that. You know, that. I wish we had that kind of luxury. So you have conferences, and conferences are great. They come in every few months, and there's nice windows. It's like a truck. If you miss one, you can always have the next one. Um, but actually, it hasn't slowed us down one bit. So as a contrast, I always like using empirical evidence. If you look at Casper's development compared to Ouroboros, we started a year and a half later than Vitalik did. And I would argue we've made significantly more progress. We defined what a secure blockchain is. We wrote a provably secure synchronous protocol. Then a year later, we had a provably secure uh, semi-synchronous protocol. And we have a new paper coming out very soon, which shows how to bootstrap from Genesis. And it's basically like everything you'd ever want for POS. And now it's just economics. And we have a pretty good idea of how to solve that. So they started a year and a half from us, but we've not only published a bunch of papers, those papers have been accepted by Crypto17 and by Eurocrypt. So from one perspective, doing things right has a much higher upfront cost, but the back end actually runs faster, especially when you're starting to try to solve more difficult problems because you have more people working on them, more people thinking about them, and also you're standing on bedrock, much more solid foundations. Now, is anything perfect? No. Just because you have a UC proof doesn't mean it works, just because it's provably secure. If you talk to Neil Koblitz, he'll remind you that it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, there's some opinions there. So that's one side of it. Then the other side is the engineering side of how do you go from the paper, let's say you make that fast and efficient, yeah. to actual running code in the repo. And then this is where the semantic gap bites you in the ass, because you have no idea that the code in your repo is the same as the paper that your cryptographer wrote, unless you've extracted a proper specification for that, right? So then you have to write a formal spec. Now, where have we written formal specs before? Like the SCL4 microkernel project, it took 10 years. So that's pretty slow, right? <laughs> so how do you reconcile this desire to do things right with the pragmatism and reality of being an entrepreneur? So to specifically answer your question, five years. Okay. That's usually how much time it takes to go from an idea to a fully finished, beautiful, polished, working 1.0 product that has some form of formalism in the specification and engineering and some form of peer review and the underlying protocols. Now, does that mean the protocols will be correct? No, but it's a fallacy to say just because it's not perfect, we shouldn't do it, right? It's better than where we're at, where people just say stuff and no one holds them accountable. The other thing is people are investing real money in these projects, and so when they do that, the first question you have to ask is, who is validating the claims that people are making? The code claims, the science claims, and these things. If you have a cult of personality, you're just trusting that Vitalik, Charles, or Dan, or others are really smart. And guess what? Smart people are really good at lying. They're the best at themselves and to others. An example I love to use is Kurt Girl. Now, Kurt, there, there's, there's very few people in your hand that you can count in human history that are smart and as just logically precise as this guy. The guy proved math is incomplete. And he did it like invoking girdle encodings and like fundamental theorem of arithmetic. This is great. This is just like the most magical proof you'll ever read. And, 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 and any time anybody went to talk to him, not only did he know your argument, he'd already thought about it and knows why it's not true. That's how smart he is. But the very same guy who's a paragon of logic and reason starved to death. 
because he thought he was being poisoned by communist spies because he's a paranoid schizophrenic. So just because you're brilliant, just because you're logical, just because you're supremely rational doesn't mean that you don't live in a parallel bonkers reality. So the, the standard should be federation, and the standard should be involving lots of people in a decision making, which there is only one way to do that with science claims. It's predictable and it's been around for a long time, but it's a bit slower. What does it mean? The market needs to moderate its expectations, and they will because all the dumb money will be driven out by the collapse of the markets and by the investigations and by the false promises that people have made. The other thing is every single time you have a bad protocol and people adopt and use it, they usually end up having the same issue. I remember with Ethereum. IBM said, wow, Ethereum is great for IoT. So they posseed up with Samsung and they had something called Project Adept. And they combined it with Telehash and BitTorrent. And guess what happened? IBM didn't end up using Ethereum, did it? Because Ethereum's an incomplete product. It's a great product, it's a brilliant product. There's a lot of inspiration there, but it's not complete. So I'm in no rush. I'll take five years, I'll do it right, and then a lot of people will join and compete who are proper scientists. And we're already starting to see that. MIT is entering the fray. Sylvia McCauley has started his own blockchain company. God, it's going to be great to compete with that guy. He's brilliant. And Sophie Goldwasser is actually probably going to start her own company soon. And we have Thunder Token to deal with now. And then uh, Yonatan, if someone tends to be somewhere around here, he's got his own thing going on with Phantom. So the real academics are showing up with real peer-reviewed work. So that means my competitors are people operating at the same time scale. It's not the IOTAs or the hash graphs or the others. No, I think that approach makes a lot of sense. And sincerely, thank you for everything. And your work's really exciting, Charles. Thank you. Well, it's the work of the company, not mine. All right, next question. One last question. Oh, but they all paid to come here, son. <laughs> okay, okay. You're not my son. <laughs> I was more like a carry on to my wayward son. Was that Kansas? <laughs> Sorry. Yes, sir. Sorry. So this question might be a little different than some of the others, but you, uh, you have a recurring theme of uh, democratization and empowerment through this technology right. and, and wanting to develop that. Um, clearly, it's a digital technology which runs over technology, over, over a device or over some kind of a computing instrument. Uh, you also mentioned that you're going to Ethiopia, and that's awesome. I've spent the last 15 years building telecom networks and emerging markets, which is a polite way of saying third world countries. And one of the largest limiting factors we always found was they just simply did not have access to end user devices, be it computers, cell phones, whatever. Right. So how do you have any vision by which this digital technology can help democratize and empower people in third world countries who are really the ones that need the most? Right. Okay, so a great question. It's kind of the last mile effect. So how do you get right. computation and infrastructure into the hands of people who don't have it? Well, the good news is we throw these away every few years and they tend to end up in those houses. So cell phones are really proliferating at a rapid rate, and uh, we are seeing rapid proliferation of internet access and rapid proliferation of computing devices. Not the kind that we love, as you're aware, but they're good enough to do a lot of things. So that's the first step, is that it's a different game today than it was even five years ago. And there's a lot of organizations that have made tremendous strides in trying to bridge that gap. Now, the reality is you're not going to have stable power, and you're not going to have stable infrastructure, so you have to deal with the intermittency problem. Second, you have to deal with the competency issue. So how do we deal with competency? Because that's the easier of the two. It's real simple. We partner with a local university. We already did this University of West Indies, and we're doing this in Ethiopia as well. And we train people. We actually train developers. We send our people there and run a class. We get as many people as possible to participate. We pay them to participate. If they're good, we hire them. If they're not good, they still got the training. So that's step one, establish a beachhead. And not a beachhead of rich white people from California, but a beachhead of people who actually live in the country and deal with the day-to-day -day problems, who are passionate about solving these problems, if only given an opportunity. Second, take advantage of the capabilities that these platforms have. Trusted Harbor, for example, allows me to do things like offline off-chain payments. That's like cash. How's that work? I transfer a private key from one enclave to another enclave. Do I need to be online for that? No! It doesn't mean it's Bluetooth connection from one phone to another phone. It'll eventually reconcile because it's in trusted hardware. You can trust that process as long as you trust the hardware manufacturer. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. You can look at ways of creating infrastructure. 
I think Facebook is thinking about that with satellites. And everybody has their favorite method, mesh nets. And sure, we can definitely explore that. But that's on the facts and circumstances. Then you've got to think about cash in and cash out points. So you need something like an ATM for that. So our solution is get an open source ATM that costs less than $500 that can run off grid and use it as a cash in and cash out point. Then that means I can personally buy a few thousand of them and give them away to local business owners who can then operate them. And that becomes kind of a micro bank that can get people onboarded into a digital identity, help people develop reputation, use it as a credit lending. There's a lot of things you can do with that. And that's being developed. Yes. So we're working on it. It's going to take a few years. Nothing is easy. It takes years, right? But that's the work of life. And you never quite get where you want to go. Bill Gates learned that. Harshly. You know, and no matter how much money or power or experience you have, you don't be humbled by the plight of people who are at the bottom of the ladder. But the magic of this technology is it's not mine. It belongs to everybody. And the key is teaching enough people and getting enough clout and getting enough infrastructure in place that people know that. And once they do, they have access to the same tech capital markets I do, being a guy here in America. That's the, that's the key. Now, where will that take us? I don't know. That's the point. No one knows. But it's different from the way the world economy works right now, with lots of volatility and capital controls and strong men and so forth. That's the magic of these systems. That's why I believe so much in them. And that's why I think we have a fair shot at being able to actually change things this time around, as opposed to the dozens of other times before. Because we're not riding on a white horse saying we're going to solve all your problems. What we're doing is giving people access to the same systems I have and saying you solve your own problems. 